us today. I just want to let you know, starting next week, Pastor John is going to start a new series with us entitled A New Normal. I'm sure you've heard that phrase a lot, maybe getting tired of it. But I just want to let you know that we're going to do a sermon series talking about some things that maybe we have learned as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, some things that we can incorporate into our lives as we move forward and really live with a new normal. But today we are, con- we are concluding our series entitled A Journey of Faith. We've looked at the life of Abraham and today we're going to be in Genesis chapter 22. Uh, I just want to start by sharing with you that uh, all 15,000 members of the 82nd Airborne at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, Uh, Before they are allowed to jump out of an airplane, they must go through uh, what they call jump training at Fort Benning, Georgia. That is, everyone does that except for private first class Jeff Lewis, who in 2000, he went from being a reservist to active duty, and he reported for duty at Fort Bragg, North Carolina with the 82nd Airborne. However, there was a clerical error when uh, Private Lewis arrived at Fort Bragg, and in this error they uh, made, they assumed that Private Lewis had been through jump training at Fort Benning, although he had never been to Fort Benning at all. And so when the time came, he followed all the other soldiers, and they all got on the airplane. They went up into the air. One by one, the soldiers jumped out, and PFC Lewis jumped out of the airplane as well. He landed on the ground safely, even though he had no formal training. Later that day, he was, his conscience got the better of him. He went to his platoon leader and explained that what had happened. When asked why he would do this, uh, PFC Lewis said, it's, it's the Army, and I'm a soldier. And if they thought I was ready to jump, I was going to jump. <laughs> he said, my job as a soldier is not to question orders, but to follow the orders that I'm given. A few weeks later, he ended up going to Fort Benning. He did all the jump training and got promoted to Specialist Lewis. But let me ask you this. If you were in his shoes, would you have jumped? What if God had told you to jump? Now, now you may be saying, well, God would never ask me to jump out of an airplane. And, And you're probably right. But think about some times in your life when God may have called you to something and for you... It seemed illogical, it seemed to you irrational, and, or maybe even seemed impossible. And it, and it really affected you emotionally and relationally and, and, and financially. Think about the times that God may have been asking you and I to be generous. And in our minds we're saying, well, how could, how could I be generous in this situation? And how am I going to make ends meet? It just doesn't make any sense to me. Or times in which maybe God has commanded you to stay in a relationship or he's commanded you to get out of a relationship because it's not good for you. And you may be thinking, well, how am I going to survive if I stay in or get out of this relationship? Or or maybe uh, there might be a time in your past or maybe a time in your future where God asks you to change jobs or to move to a new location. And you say, uh, I just can't handle that. How do you respond when God asks you to do something that for you seems irrational, illogical, or maybe even impossible? God has called us to obey in every way. And what I want to do today is I want to give you a truth from the life of Abraham. That when you hold on to it, it'll give you the strength to obey God. Even when, you, even when it doesn't make any sense to you. We've been talking about the life of Abraham, and uh, we've seen how God has really moved in Abraham's life. And Abraham's come a long way since God called him back in Genesis chapter 12 to leave his homeland of Ur. He, he's not only just traveled a long way geographically, thousands of miles, but he's also traveled a long way spiritually in his journey. We've ta- I've talked about these three different stages of faith that we see in the life of Abraham, and for many of us have traveled through these three stages of faith as well. We start off in that trivial faith, where our prayers are really all about me and uh, God taking care of me and God giving me everything that I want. Uh, 
And then we move into a tempered faith that is te our faith becomes tempered through the trials and the tribulations and the temptations of life. And, and we see that in Abraham's life and all the trials and tribulation and temptations and the 25 years he had to wait for God to fulfill the promise that he had made to him and his faith was tempered. Ultimately, God wants us to take us to that timeless faith in which we are willing to sacrifice everything, even sometimes our most prized possessions for the cause of God. And that's what we're going to see here in Abraham's life as God moves him to this timeless faith. And through all the trials and temptations and the testings of his faith, this here becomes Abraham's final exam, his final exam in this journey of faith that he has been on. We pick it up in Genesis chapter 22, and Je Genesis chapter 22 starts with these words, sometime later. Now, chapter 21 and 22 in our English Bibles are just crammed right there together, and the writer of Genesis tells us that some time has passed at this point, and most Bible scholars believe that somewhere between 15 to 20 years has elapsed between the end of chapter 21 and the beginning of chapter 22. And here we're going to see that Abraham is called to, to really take that step of faith and, and really begin to have a timeless faith. And what we're going to see in Abraham's life is going to encourage us and strengthen us when God commands us in times that don't make any sense to us. The first thing we see here is God's instructions. It says in verse, chapter 22, verse 1, Now, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Now, the writer of Genesis, we're reading this 6,000 years removed from this event. But the writer of Genesis kind of pulls back the curtain, allows us to see behind the scenes. And here he tells us that God was testing Abraham. Abraham didn't know this at the time. All he knew was that God was calling out to him. Now, many times when we say that our faith is being tested, a lot of people say, well, God wants to see what kind of faith that we really have. <laughs> God's God, right? He, he already knows that. He knows how Abraham's going to respond. Many times God tests our faith, not so much so that he, not so that he can see our faith, but that we can see our faith and the people around us can see our faith. Now, people will ask, well, why, why is God testing Abraham at this point? Some people say, well, God, Abraham is being tested by God at this point so that Abraham can really see the depth of his obedience. Is he really willing to obey God in every way? Some people say that, that maybe God's testing Abraham here so that Abraham can see where his confidence really lies. Does his confidence lie in the possessions that he has received, or does his confidence really lie in in God himself. Now, I don't know why, but we just know that God is testing Abraham, and it's good that the writer of Genesis tells us this, because what follows is shocking to us. And so the fact that we know that God is testing Abraham kind of cushions that shock for us. Because it goes on in verse 2, Then God said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah, Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Now that second verse has three unqualified imperatives. Three words, take, go, sacrifice. God says, I want you to take your son, your only son, the son that you love, the son that you have been waiting for for 25 years. I want you to take him and then go. When you go, then I want you to sacrifice him on the mountain that I will show you. And this is God's instructions to Abraham. His, his faith is being tested, although Abraham doesn't realize it at this point. And there are times in which God intervenes in our lives. And he allows circumstances to befall us where we have no idea what's going on. We have situations that come up in our life and it tests our faith and we wonder, how am I going to make it through this? We, we have those moments in our life that cause us to question, God, if you really loved me, why am I experiencing these things? 
And I don't know if that Abraham asked those questions or not, but, but many times we begin to ask those questions. And, and maybe what's happening is God is testing our faith. And when we experience those moments, those instructions from God, those moments of testing, we understand the depth of what James tells us. In James chapter 1, beginning in verse 2, listen to what he says. He says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. He said, just, be, just consider it joy when you experience these things. Because, and this is why you can look at these things with joy, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You see, God, is, God gives these instructions to Abraham to test his faith. And God gives us instructions and he places us in situations to test our faith. And James tells us to consider it pure joy because when we face these trials, we come out on the other side with a mature faith. And God uses these trials and these tests in our life to conform us and to form us more and more into the image of Jesus as, you know, in order to make us more committed as followers of Jesus Christ. Now we go on here, and, and if you thought the instructions that God gave Abraham was outrageous, look at how Abraham responds to this. What we see next here is in light of God's instructions, we see Abraham's submission. It tells us in verse 3, early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. Abraham didn't waste any time. Abraham got up early the next morning. Now, I don't know if he had a sleepless night that night. I don't know of all the questions that must have been running through his head at this point. But here Abraham, said, Abraham submits himself to God and he submits to God's instructions on his life. And as he gets up, he saddles the animals. He gets Isaac ready to go. He, he calls a couple servants together. He chops all the wood. And I can't imagine the feelings and the thoughts that are going through his mind as he's doing all of this. And, but yet God, he, he goes. God said to go, and he goes. If you think back to the beginning of Abraham's journey of faith in Genesis chapter 12, God said go. And when he said go, there was a promise attached to it. Here God tells Abraham to go, but there's no promise attached to it. And we see that this journey of faith that Abraham has been on has got to the point in which he's willing to go, even though he doesn't have a specific promise from God. And just like when he left Ur and traveled to Canaan, he, he didn't look back. He continued to go until he arrived at the place. And this is the same thing that he does here in verse 4. On the third day, he traveled three days. Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to a servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, then we will come back to you. For three days, they traveled we don't know the conversation that they must have had with each other, but they get to the location and notice the pronouns that Abraham uses here. He says, we will worship and then we will come back to you. Some people say, well, Abraham was just using the plural pronoun there just to kind of keep everybody calm, to, to keep anybody from asking any awkward questions as to what was happening. But that's not why Abraham said that. Abraham said those words because he fully believed that him and Isaac were going to go. Him and Isaac were going to come back. In Hebrews chapter 11, a writer of Hebrews is looking back on this event. And this is what he tells us. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. 
The writer of Hebrews tells us that Abraham reasoned as they were going that if I have to kill Isaac on the altar, God's just going to bring him back to life. Now keep this in mind. We don't have any recorded evidence of anyone prior to this ever being resurrected from the dead. And so Abraham must have thought this. He said, well, God promised to me for 25 years that I was going to have this son. And then finally, Isaac has been born. And God said that this son would be the one who was going to be my heir, the one who was going to be the father of many people, as numerous as the stars in the sky. And if God had promised that, and now God is asking me to sacrifice Isaac. He says, I know God has kept all of his promises for the entirety of my life. And he's not going to let me down here. And so if I do offer Isaac, God somehow is going to bring him back to life. And you see here, Abraham submits fully to the instructions of God because he trusted God that he would do what he said. In verse, uh, in, in verse 6, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Isaac, he's old enough to realize what's going on here. He says, we have the wood, we have the fire, you have a knife. We're going to worship and offer a sacrifice. We have all of this stuff, but where is the animal that we're going to sacrifice? I don't know if Isaac is starting to catch on as to what might be happening to him. But look at what Abraham says in verse 8. Again, his faith comes through in this. He said, Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. And verse 8 is the whole turning point of this whole event. Abraham said, don't worry, Isaac, God is going to provide the lamb for the, for the sacrifice. In, in verse 9, when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now, you have to realize here, Abraham is at least 115 years old, maybe even 120 his son Isaac is a late teenager, early 20s. We can assume that Isaac is probably faster than Abraham. Isaac might be stronger than Abraham. And so what we can assume from this is that just as Abraham submitted to his heavenly father, so too Isaac submitted to his earthly father. <laughs> he trusted his father just as Abraham was trusting his heavenly father, to take care of all the details in this. Let me ask you this. Do you trust your heavenly father? Do you trust your heavenly father enough to, to, to really commit your entire life to him? Do you trust your heavenly father enough to commit all of your financial resources to him? Do you trust your heavenly father enough to commit your children to him? Whatever it is, whatever your most prized possession your marriage, your, pos your possessions, your finances, your job, whatever it is. Do you trust God enough to commit all of that to him? Abraham did. And look in verse 19. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. He gets Isaac lying on the altar. He takes the knife. He's holding it high above his head, and he is about ready to sacrifice his son. And this, if it were a TV show, this is where it would cut off, and you'd have to wait till the next season or the next episode to find out what happened next. But what we see is God instructs Abraham, Abraham submits to those instructions, and then what we see next is God's provision. As, as Abraham is standing there with the knife above his head, ready to plunge it into his son's chest in verse 11. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham, I, I understand the faith that you have now because now you were willing to give 
your most prized possession. That's how we know our faith in God. Our faith is not demonstrated by by the songs that we sing. Our faith is not demonstrated by how... uh, how many times we attend a church service, although those are important, our faith is most demonstrated by the steps of obedience that we take. And here, the, we see Abraham's faith is evidenced in his obedience to God. In verse 13, Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Here God came through and he provided. Here is a a perfect fulfillment of the prophecy in verse 8. In verse 8, Abraham said to Isaac, don't worry, Isaac, God will provide for him a lamb for the sacrifice. And here we see the perfect fulfillment of that. And they offer the ram on the altar as a sacrifice. And then in verse 14, so Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. The literal Hebrew words there are Yahweh Yaira. Uh, we, we translate it into modern English, Jehovah Jaira. There's a song that we sing sometimes about that. Yahweh Yaira, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. It's actually literally translated where it says the Lord will provide. It says the Lord will see to it. The, the, the Lord will see to it. See, when you, when you hear God's instructions in your life through, through His Word, and you submit yourself to His instructions, God will always provide everything that you need. And that's our big spiritual truth this morning, is that when you obey, God provides a way. When you hear the instructions of God and you submit yourself fully to those instructions, God will provide. When you obey, God provides a way. Some questions that we have about that, like where will God provide? God will always provide in the, in the center of his assignment. God provided that ram on top of the mountain. He told Abraham, he said, I want you to take your son. I want you to go to Mount Moriah. And it wasn't until he got to the mountaintop that God provided the ram. When we obey God, it's in the center of his will that God will provide. When does God provide? He always provides just at the right time. As Abraham stood there with the knife high above his head, ready to plunge it into his son's chest, God provided a ram for the sacrifice. It wasn't a moment too soon. It wasn't a moment too late. Sometimes you may be sitting around, you may be saying, I have to wait. But listen, God is never late. And God always provides just at the right time when we obey him. How does God provide? God provides exactly what we need. Here, what they needed was a lamb for the sacrifice. And God provided exactly what they needed in order to put on the altar that day. And when you follow God's assignment in your life, when you obey in every way, God will provide exactly what you need. What we see here is in verse 1, the tester became the provider. You see, whatever God calls you to, He will provide for you. When we obey, God provides a way. To whom does God provide? He provides to those who are obedient to His plan, obedient to His instructions, that are willing to submit even when it seems irrational, illogical, or impossible. God provided for Abraham because he was willing to submit himself to his instructions. And why does God provide? God provides not solely for us, but so that he can receive the praise and the glory in his provision. And that's what we see here in Abraham's life after God provides exactly what he needed, when he needed it, where he needed it, how he needed it. 
Afterwards, it's there that Abraham says, I'm going to call this place the Lord provides, Yahweh Yaira. He is my provider. And we see that this place where Abraham offers Isaac comes back throughout the timeline of history. It's here in the same area that, that David buys the threshing floor off of Aruna in order to offer sacrifice to God. It's in this area that Jesus ultimately comes and dies on the cross to pay the penalty for my sins and your sins and was raised again in this area on the third day to give us everlasting life, to provide for us exactly what we needed. When we obey, God provides a way. When I was in seminary, I had a professor who left his job in order to go and be a pastor at a small church. He said he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that's exactly what God had called him to do. He had to take a huge pay decrease in order to do this. This was in Alaska. And he said he was pastoring a church and, 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 and finances were really tight. And the mortgage payment for his house was coming up and he wasn't sure if he had enough money in the bank in order to pay the mortgage this month. And so him and his wife and his children, they just started to pray that God would provide. He said, I know, God, you've called me to leave my job to be the pastor of this church, and I'm just trusting you to provide what I need here. He said a week later, he went to the post office. He had a post office box. He opened a post office box, and there in that post office box was an envelope. Had no address on it, had no return address, didn't even have a stamp on it. He opened the envelope, and in that envelope, to the very penny, was what he needed to pay his mortgage that month. You see, what he learned was that when you obey, God provides a way, even when it seems illogical, irrational, impossible. When we obey, God provides a way. So what do we do in those times? What do we do in those times when we know that we are following exactly what God wants us to do, that we've heard God's instructions and we've submitted ourselves to God's instruction and we're waiting for God to provide? What do we do in those instances? I want to encourage you to focus on the promises, not on the explanations. You see, our faith is not really tested until we're called to bear the unbearable. Our faith is not really tested until we're called to do the unreasonable. Our, our faith is not really tested until we are called to expect the impossible. But it's during those times in which we can focus solely on God's promises and not God's explanations. Because we're so much like my kids, right? I, I, I have my kids, I, I give them instructions on what I want them to do or not do. And their first response typically is, why? <laughs> and, and, and usually the conversation ends with me saying, because I'm your father. Because I'm your father, that's why I've asked you to do this. And in the same way, many times we come to God and we want the explanation, God, why? Do you want me to leave this relationship? God, why have you placed me in these circumstances? God, why does this seem so unbearable at this point? And we want the explanation. And what God is saying is, I want you to focus on the promises that I've made to you. I'm your heavenly father. I care about you. And I'm asking you to do this so that you can grow in your faith. We see that in Abraham's life. Again, if you look at James chapter 2, beginning in verse 20. This is what James says when he looks back on this account in Abraham's life. He says, oh, you foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. You see, the, James tells us as he looks at Abraham's life, he says our faith is always going to be manifested in obedience. 
Jill Briscoe, a, a famous public speaker, she told a story one time of her husband, Stuart, taking their son to get an x-ray. It was Friday morning, their, their son was going to school, and Stuart told their son, make sure you get your assignments for Monday because you won't be at school on Monday. Their son asked why, and they said, well, you're going to have an x-ray. The weekend went by, Monday morning came, and Stuart got in the car, his son got in the car, and Stuart looked at his son, and he was as white as a ghost. And Stuart said, asked him, he said, are, are you frightened? And his son said, of course I'm frightened. And, and Stuart asked him, well, why are you so frightened? And his son looked at him and said, well, I know what an execution is. Why would I not be afraid? And Stuart said, no, it's an x-ray, but if you thought it was an execution, why did you get in the car? And Stuart's son looked at him and said, because you're my father and I trusted you. You see, we have a heavenly father who's not going to ask us to do anything that's going to ultimately harm us because he cares about us. And when we obey, God provides a way. So I want to encourage you, even when it's irrational, illogical, maybe even impossible, to obey in every way because God will provide for you. Father, we thank you for your word today. Thank you for the way in which it impacts our lives. I pray that we as your people, as followers of Jesus, that we would obey you in all instances, in all circumstances, in all ways, trusting that you will provide for us in our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Glad you could join us today. I look forward to seeing you soon.